So welcome back to the penultimate day of the conference. And today we have Bill Minakozzi talking to us about singularities and diffeomorphisms. Thanks, Bill. All right. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, good to see everyone. I'd like to talk about some joint work with Toby. And what I have in mind here is we'll start a little bit of a, a, a journey. I'd like to explain a little bit at the start where the problem come from and then uh, talk about a purely analytic problem that arose in studying this geometric problem uh, and uh, explain a little bit what's going on with that analytic problem. Uh, and then later we'll return to the geometry. Uh, probably a lot of that will be tomorrow, but uh, hopefully at least we'll touch on some of that today. Okay, so the story starts, uh, interested in non-compact uh, singularities for Ritchie flow. And so one of the problems that you always have when you're dealing with uh, a Ritchie flow is this gauge problem. The diffeomorphism invariance uh, means that the equations, you know, they, they aren't even uh, parabolic. You have this degeneracy because of the, oh, there's my phone. Let's see, I'm gonna check and see how important the call is. Nobody minds, right? No. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, okay, so we have this uh, diffeomorphism invariance and, and we need to figure out how to deal with that. The, uh, the, the traditional way in the Ritchie flow, you know, there, there's this, uh, you know, deterk trick of gauging the problem away. Uh, there's, at this point, there's several other approaches as well. In the, um, most of these things, most of these approaches will work best uh, for compact flows. Okay, so the diffeomorphism group, when you're looking at a non-compact space, and now it's, it's a little bit harder, harder to control, uh, particularly uh, if, if you're trying to construct a good diffeomorphism, like a good choice of gauge, that often involves uh, you know, solving some PDE to construct the gauge. And if you have a, uh, the non-compact space, now all of a sudden you know, there's some real issues as to whether those solutions make sense globally. Okay, so there's gonna be, um, right, okay. So, so that's the, the problem that we're facing. So this gauge fixing, so we have this, the, the, the action of the diffeomorph, uh, diffeomorphism group, and we want to uh, do things in the correct coordinates uh, of which there are no canonical coordinates. So, you know, we're going to, uh, you imagine we have some, some Ritchie flow and it's approaching a singularity. Let's suppose the singularity is a cylinder. So let's suppose it's three-dimensional Ritchie flow and it's approaching an S2 cross R. You could, um, right? And so as it's, as it's coming into that singularity, you know that a large part of the Ritchie flow, there's a large region in, in, in the flow that's very close to a large region in the cylinder. Okay, and so you can take some identification between the two, you know some identification exists. This identification could change from scale to scale. Okay, and there's no real canonical way necessarily to, to choose it. So one of the things that you could do is if you're, uh, okay, so now let's, let me think about the problem I'm, I'm really gonna be interested in, in the end, which is suppose I have a, a uh, gradient shrinking Ritchie soliton that's close to the cylinder. So this soliton has a large region where I can find a diffeomorphism to a large part of the cylinder. And this diffeomorphism almost preserves the metric and it, it also uh, almost preserves the potential function. Okay, so what in the end, the theorem I'd like to show is that if, if it's close enough on a large enough set, then in fact, it was the cylinder. So one of the things I'm gonna to have to do is take this diffeomorphism that I'm given on a fixed set and say that I can actually extend it to a diffeomorphism on, on a larger set. The first thing I'm gonna to wanna to do is make this diffeomorphism um, orthogonal to the, to the gauge. So I'm gonna to try to choose the right gauge to do this. If I think, so orthogonal to you know, the group of diffeomorphisms. When you change the, the metric by diffeomorphism, uh, sorry, when you, uh, you, know, you, you, you have to ask what's the Lie derivative that say, all right, so back up a little bit. So the diffeomorphisms linearize uh, to give vector fields. That's the tangent space of diffeomorphisms. If I take a small diffeomorphism, I can essentially to first order, just think about what the vector field is doing. Uh, that vector field changes the metric now I need to compute the Lie derivative of the metric. And I wanna choose this. So once I've done this, I've now, I'm now orthogonal to the space of vector fields. So something like this is done in, in general relativity. You might look at 
traceless transverse uh, variations. Okay, so uh, now once we do this, this linearized problem uh, is fairly simple, but we're now on a non-compact space. If the solutions, right, as we do it, if the solutions to the linearized problem grow, then they're no longer, you know, as we move out in space, they're no longer good approximations to the nonlinear problem we were trying to solve, right? So how are we gonna deal with that? We need to somehow get some good estimates on these uh, vector fields that we produce. So this is something that comes up quite a bit in GR when you work with, with spaces that are asymptotically flat. And then uh, you might even assume that the, you know, the metric is decaying to the Euclidean metric, even at an order. And the same thing with all of its derivatives, you could set up some sort of weighted spaces with decay. Um, and under suitable hypotheses, you can, you can make things work. Okay, so, so there are a number of, of situations where you might be able to do something like that. But in the situation where, where we're in, where we just have something that's, um, you know, a gradient shrinking Ricci soliton, we don't have, uh, we're not necessarily given decay as we go to infinity. Okay, so, so how are we going to deal with that? Okay, so um, that's sort of motivating the, the, the main topic for the first part of the talk, which is understanding the growth of solutions to these PDEs on these Gaussian you know, weighted spaces. And we'll deal with some applications later. Okay, so these questions about growth of solutions to a PDE, that's, that's an old subject that, that a lot of things have been done on. So one of the places you might see this is in terms of uh, looking at local questions of growth. And so this is related to unique continuation, right? So, so growth for a local thing, this, this would mean like an order of vanishing. Like how quickly can a solution of PDE vanish as you approach a point? If we know if something's real analytic, it certainly can't vanish on an open set. Uh, strong unique continuation tells you if you satisfy something like say the Laplace equation and you vanish to infinite order at a point, then you're identically zero. Okay, so those sorts of questions come up there in terms of local growth. The global growth questions, um, those also arise. Uh, and there's some very classical, you know, old problems this is the sort of thing that people were interested in about hundred years ago. Um, and you want to know, like, if you look at polynomials, what space are they in? Weighted L2 spaces are they in? Um, and so there's an interesting result that I highlighted there, the Bernstein problem. Okay, so um, I want to explain some, some uh, growth estimates for solutions of these drift equations that apply really generally. Uh, and in fact, they apply to all uh, shrinking solitons for Ricci or mean curvature flow. So this was a little bit surprising. So a few years ago, Toby and I got interested in uh, growth estimates related to, to unique continuation for um, cylindrical ends. Uh, this also plays a role, these sort of questions play a role in some of the things that Jacob and Lou have done. Uh, and in those cases, it was really important if, for the arguments that we used, it was really important that you had a very strong structure. So in these unique continuation theorems, what really comes down, it, it ends up really mattering that you have something like a scaling. And so that involves uh, really a Hessian equation, right? So you have some function where the Hessian has a diagonal form or an almost diagonal form. That's the sort of thing that comes up over and over again. Uh, but we don't have anything like that here. Okay, so let me just uh, give you the general setup now. So now we're, we're approaching an analytic problem that I wanna hopefully convince you is interesting. Okay, so we're, we're given a manifold, M, a Ramanian metric, and then we, we put this weight on it, e to the minus f, uh, and then, uh, you know, we define this weighted L2 norm. We imagine that the function, typically imagine the function f is probably growing very rapidly. The one we always have in the back of our mind is a Gaussian, so where f would be something like mod x squared over four. And then once you uh, put this weight on with the metric, there's a natural self adjoint operator, this uh, drift Laplacian, this is a, like an Ornstein Ullenbeck type operator uh, that we've seen a number of times now with this first order term. So you have the, the principal part is the Laplacian, and then there's the first order part, which differentiates in the direction of grad F. This thing is self adjoint under reasonable assumptions on the functions U and V. Um, right? And so now, now you can ask about a spectral theory. 
So again, under reasonable hypotheses, uh, you get these sequence of eigenvalues running off to infinity. They, they all have to be, because of this symmetry condition, the, the eigenvalues, as it's written like this, have to be non-negative, um, as long as the function is in L2. And um, right, so every eigenvalue is greater or equal to zero. And if you happen to get a zero eigenvalue, then the integral of the gradient squared would be zero, so the function had to be constant. Okay, so that's the, the basic setup. And the example to keep in mind is the, uh, the Hermit operator. So just on, uh, on the line, if you look in the Laplacian is the double X derivative and then the first order term, you just take X over two uh, times the first derivative. The uh, eigenfunction equation here is called the, the Hermit equation. Um, and again, notice my convention with the eigenvalue is that it's equal to minus lambda times U and then this makes lambda always non-negative. So the, the eigenfunctions for this are, are the Hermit polynomials. And so the, you know, the zeroth one is the constant and then the linear function and then X squared minus two. And then you have this cubic function and the eigenvalues are at the half integers. So these were discovered in not exactly this form by Laplace, then rediscovered by Chebyshev. And then finally, uh, the third time, uh, I guess it took, discovered by Hermit, who they were then named after. Um, okay, and so, and again, there's, there's one. At, I notice they're all polynomials. The eigenvalue is exactly half the degree of the polynomial. Okay, so the mystery is, uh, so these, these are eigenfunctions in this weighted L2 space. The Gaussian grows like X squared over, over four. So anything that um, grew even exponentially or even like e to the, you know, to some fraction of X squared uh, would be in L2. So when we have so much room for growth, why is it that the eigenfunctions themselves only grow polynomially, right? That seems rather mysterious. So, I mean, of course, one consequence of this uh, and, and spectral theory is that uh, polynomials are actually dense in the, in the space weighted L2, since these, this is a complete basis of eigenfunctions. So everything can be expanded this way in the weighted L2. So, so why would it be when, when there's so much room for growth that the actual eigenfunctions themselves only grow like polynomials? So I just took, there's a, 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 very, there's a very easy, very Euclidean proof of this that I sketched, uh, which the, the main point comes down to that if you take an X derivative of an eigenfunction, then it is also an eigenfunction, but the eigenvalue is now shifted by a half. And it's shifted the wrong way by a half. With my convention, the eigenvalue is a half less. Okay, so what that means is, and, and again, also taking the derivatives, there's like a reverse Poincaré or Cacciopoli type argument, which shows that if you take the derivative of an L2 eigenfunction, what you get is also in L2. And that's very general and that, that holds on, on manifolds. Um, and so what this means is if we have this L2 eigenfunction, its first derivative is an L2 eigenfunction with eigenvalue lowered by a half. After I do this two lambda times, I get an L2 eigenfunction where the eigenvalue has the wrong sign, right? And so that means by what we saw before, that means after I take two lambda derivatives, what I get is actually just a constant or zero. So now if you have a function where if you take a, uh, enough partial derivatives, you get a constant, the only thing that function can be is a polynomial. And you just you know, prove that by integrating it back up one degree at a time. The integral of a, a constant is a linear function. The integral of a linear function is a quadratic function, et cetera. Okay, so, so there's a very Euclidean proof which just explains why, the, why the, the, these L2 eigenfunctions for the, uh, the ornstein ullenbeck operator are just polynomials. Of course, there's no hope of doing something like this on a manifold. You can hope under a suitable curvature condition that one derivative might satisfy a nice equation, right? Like with Ritchie curvature where you, the Bachner formula comes in. Uh, but beyond that, there, there, there's certainly not gonna be any hope. Okay, and in fact, um, when, I, when we prove polynomial growth bounds, I'm not gonna prove pointwise bounds. I'm gonna prove bounds for weighted averages. Um, you know, and, and I'll explain that as, as we go on if we get to the statement. Uh, but this statement is gonna hold under a very general 
in a very general situation. So just going to assume that the, uh, the weighted space satisfies these two structure equations. Okay, so the function f is the, is the weight. So e to the minus f is the weight that we use for the L, in the L2 measure. And there's this auxiliary function s. Uh, s in the example we care about will turn out to be the scalar curvature. Um, well, in the first example we care about will turn out to be the scalar curvature. And so we just assume that f satisfies these two equations. Laplacian of f plus s is equal to n over two and grad f squared plus s is equal to f, right? So all of you who uh, are familiar with gradient Ricci solitons will recognize these equations for, th for those. Um, and in fact, uh, the first equation is just the trace of the gradient shrinking uh, Ricci soliton equation. The trace of the Hessian gives you Laplacian, the trace of the Ricci gives you scalar, the trace of the you know, one half the metric gives you n over two. What's really interesting to me is there's no Hessian equation that's necessary. It's already enough just with, with these scalar equations. All right, I've already violated my principle of, of talking for too long without any interaction. Okay, so, uh, right, and so I just wanna remind you, so of course this applies to gradient shrinking Ricci solitons, when where S in that case is the scalar curvature. It also applies for to shrinkers and mean curvature flow in any co-dimension. And there, S is the uh, mean curvature squared. All right, so now we're, I'm, I'm working towards the statement for uh, the growth bounds. So again, as I said, I'm going to define the growth bounds, uh, not for the function itself, not for the, the, the soup of the function, but for some weighted average. It'll be a spherical, some sort of spherical average. Uh, and so the, the, once I define that spherical average, I'll start differentiating it, trying to prove that it satisfies some differential inequalities and, 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 you know, and, and going to work. The thing is that the distance function itself doesn't work very well. So, um, right, so, but what does turn out to work well is, is this sort of regularized distance function. Uh, so we're gonna define this function B, which is just gonna be two times the square root of the function F. So the second structure equation is enough to show that B is Lipschitz with gradient bounded by one, right? So this function has been used by a number of people in analyzing gradient Ricci solitons, right? So, so writing it down like this was, was the key um, in showing, for instance, the asymptotics of the, uh, right? So the asymptotics of, of the function F on the um, non-compact gradient Ricci solitons that it was asymptotic to the distance function squared times a constant. Okay, so the, the, one of the real advantages of this function is that it's Laplacian actually satisfies an equation. If we work with the distance function, the Laplacian, um, if you had a Ricci curvature condition, you might hope that the Laplacian satisfied an inequality, but you couldn't hope for an equation. So this will be crucial because in, in doing this sort of thing, you end up, you're, you're trying to prove some kind of convexity or log convexity of these spherical averages. That's a second derivative. So if you're gonna take a second derivative of a spherical average, you're, you're really getting um, a lot of derivatives on the, the uh, it, you know, using the coarea formula, you're take, hitting a, a bunch of derivatives on the, on the, the function uh, of which you're looking at the level sets up. So you really need this sort of thing. So this is, just, um, all right, I'm already regretting that as maybe too much detail. Okay, so here's the, the mysterious spherical average. So define this quantity I of R, and we wait, we put this polynomial weight in front, this, um, this r to the one minus n, and you integrate over the level set of the function where b is equal to r. You integrate the function u, you know, u squared, and then you throw another weight in there, which is the, the norm of gradient b. Okay, so this norm of gradient b uh, is very useful because using this, you can, um, yeah, right, Th this, this makes it much, uh, much better behaved when you differentiate the average. Uh, the r to the one minus n, this is supposed to, you're, now imagine it was Euclidean space and then and b was just the distance function. This would be a, a Euclidean sphere of radius r to kill off its volume, which is would grow like r to the n minus one, you would put a factor like r to the one minus n. All right, so we're gonna define this as some sort of, and think of this as some kind of spherical average. It's a weighted spherical average. If you know that the function u is in L2, this weighted average 
just has to be integrable against an e to the minus r squared over four, you know, up to polynomial factors. So that's a very weak restriction. That would allow this I of R to grow extremely rapidly and yet still be an L2. All right, so now let me, uh, here's, a, here's a theorem. Suppose we have one of these uh, eigenfunctions. So script L of U is minus lambda U. And let's suppose it's in L2. Uh, then if you have little r, which is you know, some you know, fixed scale, and then a, a larger scale, capital R, r the function i can only grow essentially like uh, the power, the, the polynomial of degree four lambda. Remember that i is, is like an L2 norm. So if u was a polynomial of degree p, then I would grow like degree 2p, right? So this is saying that U itself uh, grows at most like twice the eigenvalue in some integral sense, right? This is exactly what we observe with the Hermite polynomials. If the Hermite is degree P, the eigenvalue is P over two, okay? And so, um, in fact, there's a, a sharper result. Um, we don't need an epsilon there. We, we can put some, you know, uh, uh, but I'll, I'll come back to that later. But you can actually sharpen that. Nothing like this is known in, in this generality on Euclidean space or on cones or on cylinders. Uh, then something like this is true. In fact, so there's uh, some unique continuation type results that Toby and I proved and also that Jacob Bernstein proved in that setting. But okay. Jacob does it on expanders and trinkers, doesn't he? Yeah, that's right. So not in this kind of generality, but in, in yeah, exactly. But, but with uh, that, that sort of structure. Yeah, because I, I kind of remember that kind of this, the, the computation is rather similar. Sort of. Yep. That's right. The I, the I is, is, is essentially identical. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not quite with, we have the grad B there, there you're allowed to. Well, I think he also has a grad B. Yeah. This is what I was wondering because you wrote, yeah. he doesn't, because I remember there is a grad B. Yeah. He also has to take this, the right the right distance function there on the on the on the expander and take the gradient of that. Yep. Yep. That's right. Okay. So this now stated this for eigenfunctions, it holds with differential inequalities. And so it it, it works, you know, for tensors. And, and in fact the main application will be to a, a specific tensor. Let me just mention the tensor that I want to apply it to. We're going to apply it to this operator which we call script P. And so this is a uh, an operator on vector fields. To define the operator uh, so let me just remind you, there's this div f, which is this um, divergence in the, with the weight uh, and it's adjoint div f star. So the div f star is up, is up to a constant, the constant minus two. It's the lead derivative of the metric in the direction of y. And so then this operator p is just this composition. So it's an operator from vector fields to vector fields. So div f star maps the vector field to the, uh, the lead derivative of the metric. And so this is a two tensor symmetric two tensor. Uh, and then you use div f to go back to vector fields, right? And so this is the actual operator that we want to apply it to. And so on a uh, gradient Ricci soliton, so if it's a you know, shrinker, steady, or expander, uh, the operator P is, is uh, related to the operator to the drift Laplacian. So this is a drift Laplacian on, on vector fields. Um, and it differs by this a zeroth order term, which just is a, depends on which expander you, you have, on, on which soliton you have. And then the other one is uh, taking the gradient of the, the divergence, the, the F divergence of Y. Okay, so that's the, later on, that'll be the, um, the op, one of the, the, the two operators that we want to apply this to. Okay, so um, right on. So now we have this uh, spherical average uh, I of R, uh, and then we, there's this frequency, which measures the rate of, of growth, U of R. So I just, okay, so what I should say, so right now what I wanna do is just give you a very rough idea for why the estimate works in, in this setting. Um, and it comes from differentiating I of R. One of the things uh, that, that you get now, um, Okay, so, so we'll, we'll get a differential inequality for I of R. Let me just mention why, um, what we do know about I of R. Since it's in L2, we know that I of R 
can't really grow faster than e to the r squared over four. At least it can't everywhere be bigger than that. So roughly speaking, right, since log of i prime is like two u over r, so differentiating that, so log of the e squared over four would give us the r squared over four. So, so you roughly expect that u can't be any bigger than r squared over four. And so the pr a more precise statement is that it, this frequency, this rate of polynomial uh, growth uh, couldn't always be above r squared over four, otherwise it would grow out of L2. Okay, so now where does it, where does it come from? So there's this funny differential inequality um, that you get for the log of u. Uh, and so it shows, if, uh, so the dif differential inequality tells you that if u gets above two lambda and the radius is large enough, then the derivative of log of u has this lower bound right here. So if you look at the, the, so the first term is like a one over R term, that's lower order. The second term has the R in front. So that's gonna be the dominant term. And if you look at the, um, it will be increasing anytime that, that lambda over U is smaller than the half, right? So once U gets bigger than two lambda, that linear term in the second is gonna dominate whatever is going on in that first one over R term. And so once u gets above two lambda, log of u must grow, u must grow. And so that will continue until the first term becomes dominant, right? And if the second term is essentially an r over two, the first term becomes dominant when that u over r kills that, which forces u to grow like r squared over two. Okay, so once u gets above two lambda, it ends up really being forced to overtake r squared over two. But what we saw on the previous slide is that if you're in L2, you can't have U bigger than R squared over four, you know, forever. Okay, so, so that's the, the rough idea, right? It's a little bit complicated by, so I, I'm brushing a few details uh, under the rug here. One of the things is that these level sets of this function B, they aren't even necessarily all that nice. So it, the function's not really differentiable. It's just differentiable almost everywhere and absolutely continuous. And, and then, you know, there's, so there's some, nonsense like that, but, but this is essentially the, the idea uh, of where that comes from. Okay, so one of the things that, that's, um, right, that, that, that's interesting, in fact, if you, if you really tweak that argument, you see that you get a better bound. So you see that in fact, the, uh, the frequency u, instead of being bounded by like two, uh, two lambda plus epsilon, um, you actually get that the next term in the expansion is like a one over r squared, uh, is a constant over r squared. And surprisingly, that's actually sharp on her meat. So if you look at the degree m her meat, there's lambda m over two, and you get exactly that expansion with the one over r squared. And in fact, even the constant is sharp. So if you look at the dependence on lambda, it's the same sharp dependence. So the sort of low regularity argument is surprisingly sharp, right? So, so that, that's you know, where this growth comes from, um, right? And so now, we have these, these solutions of this drift equation, or in fact, drift inequalities are gonna satisfy you know, the, these, these very good polynomial growth bounds. One of the things that makes this so useful is that in these weighted L2 spaces uh, with the Gaussians, we're often able to show that something is exponentially small. Okay, so if you look at something, suppose you, you, know, suppose you had something, um, where you're only introducing error terms out at an outer boundary using a cutoff function. With the Gaussian weight, the error terms that you introduce are on the order of the e to the minus r squared over four when r is the outer radius. Okay, and so that often gives you, L, you know, these L2 estimates that are exponentially small in that way. So on a unit scale, those L2 bounds give you that, um, you know, and, and some interpolation arguments will give you that whatever quantity you're interested in is actually exponentially small at, at, at a unit scale. If you couple that with that it can only grow polynomially, uh, the quantities end up being extremely small out in a, at a larger radius, okay? So there's this funny property um, with these, you know, with, with, with shrinkers or in general with these drift uh, Laplacians where things tend to propagate outwards. Right, so if you have some control on a compact set, it gives you some, you know, strong control even on larger sets. Sorry, but from like a parabolic point of view, does that correspond to backwards in time? Yeah, that's right. 
Oh, yeah. I also have a question. Have you mm -hmm. ever tried in the round case? Yeah. So when your cross section is the round sphere, is there any hope of getting kind of the shrinker rigidity by just using neck improvement? Ah, uh, I haven't tried that. Because you know, so, assume you have a shrinker which is sort of close on a very big compact set to a mm -hmm. to a to a round shrinker, then it's you kind of have a neck. Yeah. You could just go yeah, forward so which, and try. Uh, Felix, which one are you, uh, which are you thinking of the Richie or the mean curvature flow right now? Both either. either. Yeah. I think there's neck improvement for both. Yeah. Yeah. Would be yeah, but this would be interesting to see if sort of if neck, you know, if, if you say, okay, you know, just go forward in time, your neck improves, and you can just scale back and yep. maybe can get some information from there. I was just wondering if, if anyone has ever tried. Yeah, I have not tried. Um, it's possible. That sounds like the sort of thing Bob might try. I don't know if he's tried it. No. Just wanted to ask if sort of if there's a reason, if there's a if you've tried this and there's a reason why something like this cannot work. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm gonna. So I, I mentioned this application to to the gauge uh, to solving the gauge problem, and I'll return to that later. Before I do, I want to talk about a, another application of of these uh, growth estimates, and this is something that we call propagation of almost splitting. Uh, and so this it's the the general statement. Uh, the rough statement is that if you have a this Richie uh, Richie shrinker that's close to a product on some large scale. Uh, then it has to remain close on a fixed larger scale. Right, so, so the rough idea is that if you're uh, close to a product on this first scale, then on that scale, you have these uh, almost linear functions. Okay. These almost linear functions are going to give you some test functions uh, to show the linear functions uh, are the, uh, end up being lowest eigenvalues on a Ritchie shrinker. So I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so if you, the lowest an eigenfunction could ever be on a Ritchie shrinker is the eigenvalue that you get for a linear function, right? Uh, that's, it's the analog of the uh, Obata theorem for, um, yeah, for, for Ritchie curvature. And so these, these will give, these almost linear functions are going to give you very low eigenvalues. In fact, depending on the closeness, they'll give you exponentially small eigenvalues. And so we can, um, you know, we can do this globally on this mystery shrinker. And so this mystery shrinker comes with these low eigenvalues. Now, the next thing that we do is uh, these eigenvalues will get a, a, a very good, you know, there'll be a very good Hessian estimate. So these, I, these eigenfunctions that we produce are gonna be themselves almost linear on a fixed scale, on a unit scale on the manifold, on this, the, the mystery shrinker. Now for this mystery shrinker, we use this polynomial growth to say that these things that were exponentially small on a unit scale only grow polynomially. And so they end up being small on a much larger scale than the initial scale. This is the idea. And so this linearity is propagating uh, outwards in space. Okay, so let me just um, now run through some of that or try to give the ideas of some of that. The first thing is, let me just remind you of the Lichnerowitz theorem and, and, and the Obata rigidity. So if you have a manifold with, with Ricci curvature, at least that of the sphere, um, an n-dimensional manifold with Ricci at least n minus one, and you have an eigenfunction, then if you integrate the Bachner formula and do some integration by parts, uh, you get this, this inequality that uh, the eigenvalue minus n you know, times this L2 norm, has to be at least some constant times the L2 norm of the trace-free Hessian. Okay, so that's the displayed equation there. Obviously, the trace-free Hessian, the it's L2 norm is non-negative. So the immediate consequence is that the, the eigenvalue lambda has to be at least n, right? Um, okay, and so that's the Lichnerowitz theorem. Uh, if you happen to have a quality in this, so if the eigenvalue was exactly m, then the trace-free Hessian vanishes. And Obata used this to prove that, in fact, the, the manifold was Sn. Okay, so these eigenfunctions satisfy a Hessian equation. And this, this Hessian equation gives this stronger structure. Okay, let me just remind you of what the analog of this is uh, in the bakri emery world. And so here, I'll, I'll, I'll do it if it's actually a, a, a Ritchie shrinker, but the same thing, a similar thing would apply 
uh, if this Bakri Emery curvature was bounded from below, Bakri Emery Richard curvature is bounded from below. So this time, what we get is that the, the L2 norm of the Hessian of the function is bounded by lambda minus a half times the L2 norm of the gradient. And so, of course, the, the first corollary is obviously this means that the, the, the eigenvalue has to be at least a half. Uh, but then obviously there's the, this uh, consequence of equality that if the eigenvalue is a half, the function had to be linear. So it's Hessian vanished. And so in that case, what this means is that, is that the shrinker uh, splits, right? And so that's you know, standard and, and, and well-known. Um, okay, but now what we want to think about is what about the case of not when you have actually equality, but when you have almost equality. Okay, so suppose that the eigenvalue is near a half. Uh, then what this means is the L2 norm of the Hessian is small, right? And so then these functions, they aren't actually linear, but the Hessians are, uh, you know, in some integral sense, they're almost linear. Right, so now how, how would this apply in, in, in our setting for this propagation of, of almost splitting? So if you have this gradient shrinking Ricci soliton and, and then you have this large region, which is close to being linear, this region, um, you know, if you just look at the identification with the, 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 uh, the, um, the splitting example, uh, that, that coordinate function, that gives you your linear function. Okay, so we have these functions where the Hessian almost vanishes, the functions are almost linear. Now, these functions are only defined in the region where we make the identification. But we can just extend these functions to the larger manifold by multiplying by a cutoff function, just cut off at this outer boundary. Right, at this outer boundary, the Gaussian weight right, is extremely small because of this e to the minus, uh, e to the minus f. f is something like r, uh, sorry, r squared over four. And so we introduce an error term of e to the minus r, r squared over four, right? Okay, so, um, right, so this is the slide that I'm basically describing, right? So you have these, these almost linear functions. This gives it this mystery manifold has these eigenvalues that are exponentially close to a half. And so these eigenfunctions on the mystery manifold, the mystery shrinker, have this inc incredibly good Hessian bound. All right, I'm, I'm lying a bit all over the place here, but I'm just trying to give the idea. So the closeness, so typically in, in applications, the closeness that we can prove isn't quite r squared over four, it's r squared over eight whatever, it's, it's an exponential closeness, but I, so I just wanna, you know, so if you go look at the paper, this won't match any equation that you see there, but this is the idea. Okay, so now um, from a rough point of view, so just if, if I pretend these uh, L2 bounds, if I think of them as being uh, pointwise bounds, this tells me that roughly speaking, the Hessian squared is gonna behave something like this uh, e to the, R, little r squared minus capital R squared over four when B is equal to R, right? So this, um, if I go out to the outer scale, when I get out, when B is equal to capital R, this just says the Hessian's bounded, right? And if I try to go beyond scale R, the Hessian could grow enormously. There's essentially no bound on the Hessian, right? But if I look at some unit scale, then this tells me that, that the Hessian is exponentially, that this Hessian is exponentially small. So these, so I started with these um, sort of transplanted almost linear functions, use those you know, in a, in a Raleigh quotient to get a bound for the eigenvalue. Then I, I built these eigenfunctions. Now I'm saying the eigenfunctions actually have small Hessian on the small scale, okay? Next, I'm gonna say that the Hessian of this eigenfunction satisfies one of these type drift equations. Again, with then now there'll be error terms, right? And so what this means is that that Hessian itself can only grow polynomially, right? So once, so this thing that started off like e to the minus r squared over four, by the time I get out to scale r, a priori, it could have been like one, but once I bring in the polynomial growth, it's e to the minus r squared over four times r to a power, right? These exponentials are gonna overwhelm any polynomial. 
And so what this means is that I'm going to get this L2, this average L2 bound out to a much larger scale. And so this says that in this integral sense, this splitting, which was initially out to one, the scale R, actually lives to a much larger scale. Okay, so that's um, right. So, so we see where this polynomial growth played this crucial role to take this exponential smallness um, and, on, and, and, you know, together with just polynomial growth to give control at, on a much bigger scale. And this is, and now you can imagine, suppose you could start iterating this, right? And, and, you, and say it's now exponentially close at this larger scale. You can imagine an iter iterative argument of this that would then allow you to say the whole thing splits, right? Okay, and so this, um, right? So this this makes it sound, you know, really, you know, rather rather hopeful from that point of view. Okay, so there's a a, a couple of issues here. So one thing that comes in, um, right? Is, is you, yeah? Maybe it's maybe it's better not to say too much there. Right, you might want to. You might wonder how are you going to turn these uh, these L two estimates into pointwise estimates, and 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 how are you going to? Uh, another issue that comes in here is if you look at the equation that if you apply the operator script L to the Hessian of U, you get some curvature terms coming in now. Right, and in fact, they aren't even Ricci curvatures because the Hessian you really get this um, the same curvature terms that come up like in this list narrow it's Laplacian. And so there's, there's some arguments involved in, in dealing with that, but this is, uh, I think this, this, this gives a good sense of the idea. Okay, so I wanted to, to talk a little bit about the, uh, the gauge problem. Before I do that, uh, Felix, you've been good with questions, but does anyone have, are there any comments about the, or, or questions about this propagation of, of almost splitting? Regarding your last comment, I think isn't it sort of on a on a Ricci shrink or expander? Isn't the the Ricci tensor in the kernel of the Lichnerovich operator naturally? Uh, yeah, yeah, you get an idea. I think was, there's an identity like that that sort of somehow the Ricci is is this related? You know, if you look now at that, some of the Hessian itself also sort of is. You get yeah. So so the Ricci. Uh, yeah, it, it satisfies a nice equation with this hard L operator, which is the second vari variation operator for the, the you know, the, the Perlman uh, entropy, like the, the Chow Hamilton uh, yeah. dominant. Uh, but that operator has a, a full curvature piece in it. Mm -hmm. So it has it right. It has a like a script L piece, but then it has a, the, a, the full curvature tensor appearing as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And so um, that ends up playing a role, uh, right? So Okay, so a couple of things. So this this growth stuff, uh, for some things you can apply it just on the model shrinker, uh, because what you're doing is you have something you transplant everything to the model and then you apply cutoffs, you know, much like we we did in the uh, mean curvature flow case. Uh, but for this particular estimate, all right, and, and so for that it's no problem that this full R, the full curvature comes in, but for this particular estimate the full curvature is a bit of an issue because you want to work with the eigenvalues on the, you know, on the ex potentially exotic shrinker where you only have some curvature control on the, the fixed set where you know something um, and the curvature may be quite mysterious once you leave it. Yeah, but it's this, the same operator. If you apply this hard L operator to the Hessian of U, um, you, you get a nice equation as well. It, it becomes the Hessian of the script L operator applied to U, which, which works very well, but then we do have the, the, the full R term. Right. Oh, and the one th other thing that that was a bit mysterious to me is this. This is quite different than um, than than what works for the uh, the mean curvature flow. Um, so you don't get a corresponding characterization of the of the bottom of the spectrum for the mean curvature flow shrinkers. In fact, um, right. So the linear functions come in at a half again uh, for mean curvature flow, but it's not known whether you know there might be eigenvalues below that. And in fact, that's closely related in the higher co-dimension case to this conjecture of Yao for the, the lowest eigenvalues uh, for minimal submanifolds and spheres, because of course the minimal submanifolds and spheres do give you higher co-dimension um, mean curvature flow shrinkers. 
and and there the uh, the eigenvalues match up exactly, right? And so the question is, do the do the linear fun do the coordinate functions in that case always give you the lowest, and that's not known. So there's no corresponding characterization of of the lowest eigenvalues or or any rigidity in that mean curvature flow case. This seems to be a just a Ricci flow uh, phenomenon, right? So the second thing that I want to talk about is just come back to this. I, I mentioned this script L operator and, and how we want to solve the gauge problem. Okay, so, and again, so once we, um, you know, we integrate, so we take this vector field V, we integrate it to get a, a diffeomorphism psi, um, right? And, and, and then this generates these equivalent metrics. And then if you differentiate what's happening to the metric, you just get this, this operator, missing a sub F, which is, is the, um, the Lie derivative of the of the metric in, with respect to the vector field okay which is this operator div f star and um this div f star has this adjoint uh div f this is an adjoint in, in the weighted space and so that operator this shows up um you know the first time i saw this operator was in this uh, uh paper by uh, chow Ham uh, hamilton and, and ilmanen uh when they computed the uh the, the second variation um and so uh, that, that the 2004 archive paper. Um, and so then for a tensor, if you wanna be uh, orthogonal to the image of div, sorry, so div F star, the image of div F star, this, this is the image of the diffeomorphisms. This is the tangent space to the group action. And being orthogonal to this uh, by L2 methods, this just means you're looking for things where, where if you apply the div F operator, you get zero, right? And so, what this means is that you want to apply a diffeomorphism so that when, oh, sorry, this difference H is the difference between the, uh, the, the two metrics, right? And so now you want to apply a diffeomorphism so that after you do it, the new H uh, as div F is div F zero, it's, it's essentially divergence, weighted divergence free. And so this means this new thing is orthogonal to the, to the group action. Okay, and so we have this operator P um, which is this composition. And so the problem that we're trying to solve, the nonlinear, uh, sorry, the linear problem that we, that we want to solve is that we want to find a vector field Y uh, so that P of Y is, is one half of div F of H, right? And so that's all, this is at a linear level, this is what, what solving the gauge problem means. Okay, um, right, all right. So, uh, right, and so, so for solving this gauge problem, uh, that's, that's this nonlinear problem. Now, the first thing that, that, that comes in is once you, um, right, if, so if you want to do, run an iteration scheme to solve that nonlinear problem uh, by repeatedly solving the linear problems, getting better and better approximations to the nonlinear, uh, well, the nonlinear is only well approximated by the linear when the solution is small, right? And that's a pointwise small. So this means that we're trying to solve this, this nonlinear equation with very good estimates on the solution. We're doing it on a non-compact space, um, you know, and we'll, we'll solve this on a, like expanding sets. It'll be absolutely crucial that our, our vector fields Y that we produce are really, really, you know, remain small. So the, uh, the initial error is gonna be exponentially small. So we'll work on some scale R. This initial error is gonna be exponentially small on the scale R, uh, and we want to produce this thing out to you know a larger scale. That's that's generally the way the scheme goes. You work on a scale R where you know things are good. You want to then say that things remain good on on this larger scale. If you produce these, um, you know, by the L two methods, if you produce the solution Y on scale R, it's exponentially small on that scale. But once you go beyond the scale R, you don't have anything. You know, there, there's there's no control, and so that's again where the uh, where the growth bounds to go. The exponential smallness on, on one scale will then, plus polynomial growth, will give us this, you know, that it remains very, very small even on these larger scales, right? So that's the way the two things mix. Okay, so one last point um, that I wanted to, to mention is even after uh, you worry about this gauge problem, there's one other problem that comes up here, and, and that is um, the potentials are always allowed to differ by a linear function. Right, so you have this tr uh, translation invariance on the cylinder that you have to mod out for as well. And so this, um, 
right? So, so to deal with this, we, we define something called, you know, this, we define like a center of mass vector. And so at the same time that you want to fix the center of mass, uh, sorry, that you fix the gauge by choosing this diffeomorphism, you also have to fix the center of mass, right? And so, um, and so fortunately, this, this actually was a, a, a um, right, sort of a happy discovery uh, because in, we found that as we were solving this gauge problem, we found there was an indeterminacy. So there was this uh, current, the, the, there was one more parameter that was left over. Our solution wasn't really well-defined. It was defined up to choosing a killing field. And so that, uh, in this case, that killing field is this, could be this translation along the axis. And so this last parameter exactly uh, makes, makes everything match and, and, and makes the problem uh, uniquely solvable. Okay, so that's, that's what I wanted to say. So let me stop there. I hope I gave some picture of, of some of the ideas and how things are intertwined. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Bill, for the, for the talk. So for me, curvature flow, you had this wonderful theorem that the axis of cylindrical tension flows is unique. Do you have any corresponding application for Rachel flow? Uh, no, we, that's, uh, that's in preparation, uh, so, um, so to speak, which means, no, we can't do it yet. Uh, the, right, so, so it should follow a very similar theme, right? So I, I haven't, um, yeah, I, I haven't laid out too much, uh, you know, so there's, there's several, other, so tomorrow what I'll talk about is I'll mention, uh, this, these are all ingredients in improving this, like, uh, rigidity of the cylinders. And so there, the same sort of thing happens where if something looks like, if you have a shrinker that looks like a cylinder on one scale, then it has to look even closer to a cylinder on a larger scale. Sure. And so that was the key, uh, you know, crucial again in the mean curvature flow case, uh, even in, in, in a flow version of that. What happens here is I don't, I don't yet know. So the gauge stuff, we have a nice um, flow version of the gauge fixing. What I don't write, which I don't know yet, and, and we're working on right now, is trying to find the flow version of this propagation of almost splitting. Okay, so we have one version of that which looks promising, which is works for like a, a rescaled Ricci flow. Um, and so there's some similar statement and we can get some sort of L2 estimates. Uh, it's harder, I'm not sure yet whether those will work at, to the pointwise level and whether they'll give sufficient improvement. So the answer is yes, it looks promising. I think something like that should work and, and, and be true. Uh, but don't know how to do it yet. Oh, I see. So, so, so I mean, I've just been wondering what, what even would be the geometric statements of a mean curvature flow. It's clear to say what it means, like the axis is unique, but for, yeah. for Ritchie flow, there's not even a notion of axis. So either. here, yeah, that's right. So, so in mean, right, so this, this gauge uh, invariance, in mean curvature flow, it comes down to two things. So there's this question of the axis, and there's this, um, right, so, so that's like, that's the one parameter that's left. And there's also this question of, of what's happening to the, the diffeomorphism. And the diffeomorphism in the mean curvature flow case, we, we just remove that from the problem by asking for normal motion, mm -hmm. right? And it's these finite parameters that, that, that were this degeneracy here. So instead of, and so that's why in the second variation, we had this kernel that, that really came from these, um, you know, at some level from rotations. And then there was this also this thing that came from, uh, you know, the translations and all of that. In this problem, there's really like, the whole diffeomorphism group plays that role. So there's this infinite dimensional space of, of things that you're really trying to control along the flow. And so the question of uniqueness um, of, of rigidity doesn't quite see that. That really comes in more at the level of the, the flow where, where even if you knew that each slice was a cylinder, how do you, not, how do you know that, that the Ritchie flow doesn't have some crazy, why, why wouldn't there be some crazy diffeomorphism stuff going on too? Maybe that's so, so fixing sort of fixing the axis in the end means, in some sense, that you control the diffeomorphisms. You're really controlling the diffeomorphisms, and you're so really this, controlling the coordinate functions on these on these things. Yeah. So, in some sense, it's something like controlling the space-time track a little bit. Is that sort of the right yeah, idea? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a rough idea. Yeah, or, or not a rough idea. That's a yeah, rough way to say it, probably. Yeah. 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 Right, and, and so in the, yeah, it's something else I should have said. In the mean curvature flow case, once you go to normal motion, you've modded out for that whole gauge equivalence. Um, but here, with the diffeomorphism, we're trying to mod out by this infinite dimensional thing. We can't get a pointwise condition. There's no pointwise condition to add. 
And so we have to, this integral condition, you know, creates a lot of difficulties. Is it clear in the, in the, in the flow problem what to replace this frequency function with? Because, you know, this is, this seems to be clearly an elliptic thing. To right, have that's, right. that's right. Yeah. So there, there are these, uh, no, it, the answer is no, it's not clear. I've tried a bunch of things. You know, there are these frequencies uh, for heat equations. Yeah. Okay. But it's and a different so, thing. It goes in time and sort of not, not out in space. It, yeah, it does. Yeah, it, it does both. It does both. It does both. It's, yeah. It's moving, yeah, it's moving in space and time simultaneously in the in the heat in the uh, for the the heat equation. But the I've I've tried a number of possible like drift frequencies. That one of the issues is that usually so that these frequencies for the heat equation usually involve integrating against an entire heat kernel, and so they don't localize as well in the same way. The heat kernel is sort of localizing because it's peaking. It's concentrating in the area that you want, but it's detecting things that are further out. Uh, right. So again, this the, the the curse of infinite propagation speed. To me, I guess it's related to this, to this formulas of Ecker. Am I right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So he's he does that by integrating over space time balls. You know, these yeah. parabolic space time balls uh, instead of just looking at one time. Yeah. yeah. Is there a question in the chat? Do you, do you also hope to get a Voyasevich inequality in the case of Ritchie flow similar to MCF? So right at this point yeah at this point we hope to get uniqueness um i'm not sure what i i don't necessarily see that it will go over a way of shavits no question what form would such an inequality take in richie flow are you exploiting the the gradient like structure in that case yeah that's probably yeah you're probably right you probably look for something like a um yeah yeah the gradient like so the way perlman rewrites it uh, suppose you would what so if you want to do uniqueness there what you might well look at is a rescaled Ritchie flow where the shrinkers are the fixed points, mm -hmm. right? And so there, and then this is a, the gradient flow for a, a one of the Perlman type entropies. Um, and then, so you would look for a way of Shavitz for that quantity along that flow in the non-compact case. Thank you. One more question, Matt. So yeah, of course. I was just wondering what problem you actually solve specifically for the gauge problem. Like if you're, initially close on this large set. So do you have to, so do you come in a little bit and then it sort of solves it exactly uh, once you come in and with some uh, control of control? Or? Yeah, so we, we solve, yeah, so we end up having to solve an, a, a number of gauge problems, but yeah, basically, okay, so here's the way it works. So you have closeness, and I'll say more about this tomorrow, I think you have closeness on a scale R and, and then it almost splits there. So the almost splitting, then gives you some closeness on an even larger, a slightly larger scale. The propagation of almost splitting gives it closeness on a larger scale. At this point, you solve a gauge problem on this larger scale. So now you'll come back in a little bit, but not much. So you're not all the way back to the initial scale. You come in a little bit. And so now on this scale, it's almost splits and it's almost orthogonal to the group action. At this point, there's a third ingredient. There's, there's like a quadratic rigidity, uh, right? So there's a rigidity of the cylinder at a quadratic level. And so this allows, this gives an improvement um, on this scale. And so now, th so this slightly larger scale is even closer than you were originally. And now you run the game repeatedly. Yeah, so maybe you mentioned it on the way there, but sort of it's, um, in what sense is it almost orthogonal to the group action? Uh, you make the, um, Right, so being orthogonal to the group action would mean that the weighted divergence operator of the variation is zero. And so what you do is, is the, if you apply this div f to the difference, the variation you know, the, between the two things, the, the, between the two metrics of, you know, one's composed of the diffeomorphism, but between that, uh, div f of that is, is extraordinarily small in the weighted L2 space, mm -hmm. Expo exponentially small. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bill.